Hi, my name is Albert Leikoff. I'm the co-founder and executive director for the Center for Art in Wood. David Stevens and Gerard Brown invited artists to come and respond to the Center's museum collection. My name is Lewis Colburn. Gerard Brown is on the exhibitions committee here at the Center for Art and Wood. He nudged the center to engage with the community of younger artists in Philadelphia that form these collective organizations. Gerard approached a few of our collectives. I volunteered myself as the coordinator and have since been working with the 18 artists in the show. So we've got artists from Napoleon, Tiger Sex Asteroid, McCartney Belknap, technically also artists from Box Populi, and then uh, a couple of our members are curators, and so they invited other artists as their contribution to the show. We have a situation here. It's uh -oh. like the Crips and the Bloods. I see a Tiger Strike guy and a Napoleon guy. We get along really well. We're doing a project in February of 2017 where Napoleon and Tiger Strikes Asteroid are going to co-host this collective from Seattle that's over 20 years old. And I think we're going to get the show out there, too. So I haven't really been too tuned into that process, but it's great to hear this moving forward. Yeah. So. All right, how do you guys come up with the names for your organization? For Tiger Strikes Asteroid, you'd have to ask Alex Paik. He's the guy who came up with it. It was thought up by Alex Paik and Big Pike because he thought it sounded like a uh, kung fu movie. So. And how about Napoleon? Uh, we're a very small space with large ambitions. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. And my piece in the show responds to a couple objects in the collection. There's a bundle of spindles from the John Grass Wood Turning Company, and a piece called Walking Stool that has turned wood legs with wooden shoe lasts on the bottom. Shoe lasts were made with a machine called the Blanchard lathe, which was one of the earliest machines that could duplicate an irregular three-dimensional object. We found out about that in our research library. So my piece is a kinetic sculpture that loosely references the Blanchard lathe with a cast iron turn spindle with a shoe last attached to it and then a drum with many of them and many more stacked on the floor as if it were sort of producing these objects. A lot of my work deals with history, recreating objects, reenactment of past events, and it deals a lot with how history is constructed, how we retell stories and how they change in the retelling. Speaking of constructions, can you explain how you constructed your mustache? <laughs> Wax every day. <laughs> four months back in 2009 to grow it and I've kept it since. <laughs> Hi, my name is Mark Brasso. I'm the co-director of Tiger Strikes Asteroid. Here in Philadelphia, we're a 10-member co-op. New York also has 10 members and Los Angeles has close to 10 members. And I got excited by the dynamic of the collection as a whole, which is why I made the accordion book drawing the juxtaposition of the different objects and the experience of moving your way through the collection. And that's what I got the most excited about. Were you familiar with art made from wood before this or was this kind of an eye-opening experience coming here? I was familiar with someone like Nakashima, but that was sort of the extent of my familiarity. I, I had no idea the extent of this collection and how diverse and wonderful it really is. The wood has been an artist's medium for a very long time. Many of these younger artists incorporate a high-tech component into their work. I'm Joanna Platt. I'm an artist from Philadelphia. I'm, I'm trained as a metal worker. I don't usually work in wood, so it's really a little bit of a stretch for me. I have an absolutely debilitating fear of the table saw, so I had a friend of mine help me do the, the wood part of this piece. I usually do video installations that are streaming out of electrical boxes that interact with whatever the space they're in. The Marcel Duchamp piece in the PMA, the Peep Show piece, was one of the big inspirations for me as a kid. So when I saw the kaleidoscope piece here, I immediately responded to that. A lot of my work has these hidden video components where it's something that you're not really expecting. I realized that a lot of the patterns in wood look like kaleidoscope patterns. And then I started researching the knot holes and realizing that they were dead limbs where the tree was trying to heal itself. So I started playing with this idea of what would a phantom limb look like? What would the memory be hidden in this knot hole? And so I went back to South Jersey and I filmed a pine tree blowing in the breeze, which is what the video image is inside this knot hole. So it's kind of about the memory of what this limb might have been. 
uh, in the plywood. Independent curator Sean Stoops brought two artists into the show. At first glance, Jason Gandy's sculptures appear as beautiful and evocative objects. But then, you notice the peepholes. You look inside and see something marvelous. They say that each generation's IQ is getting higher, and I didn't doubt it once I started talking to the other artist that Sean Stoops curated into this show. Hi, I'm James Johnson. It's a brand new work. I've made it over the past three, four months. The work is a large vitrine made out of plywood, which has two apertures on the front surface of it. Uh, there's a small one on the left, which is capped by a two-way mirror, and then a larger one on the right, which is open to the viewer. A lot of the conceptual counterparts of the work come out of research that I did. I teach at Moore College of Art and Design, so I was on sabbatical in the fall. And so I was doing research on some new materials, digital fabrication. I've been reading a lot of economic theory and this movement in philosophy called speculative realism. Graham Harmon has this theory called object-oriented ontology. What is the relationship between a cup and the water that is contained by the cup? Another artist who uses video in his work was taken with one particular object made by the John Grass Turning Company. The Billy Club, because of what it holds as far as a vessel for oppression, and it was used previously by police officers to attack, to strike fear. The Billy Club, along with a video camera, are hidden behind a two-way mirror in a plexiglass box. There's a video monitor nearby. The video switches. Uh, sometimes it's live, sometimes it's recorded. I have a background in painting and printmaking. I'm more content-driven rather than medium-driven. To me, this piece has great power and relevance to our postmodern state of constant surveillance. I bet Edward Snowden would dig it if he could sneak into the center to see it. Hi, my name is Tim Bennett. I managed to snag Tim as he was leaving the center to go to the opening of his one-man show at Vox Populi. After going through the collection several times, I was really fascinated by the idea of future and the futurism that's happening up in the permanent collection with the robots, the architecture. And so I started to look at old sci-fi films, Doctor Who. My piece is a log with a giant rock on top with a fake bird, as well as that spiraling, a nod to Doctor Who, that sense of time travel. Do you ever hypnotize yourself accidentally by looking at your own art? Uh, no, no, knock myself out, but I haven't hypnotized myself, yeah. Tim Belknap's art colleague, Ryan McCartney, created a piece that references the famous dog Nipper of record label fame, listening to his master's voice. Ryan's work consists of a turn bowl and cow femur shards. Hi, my name is Leslie Friedman. I've been working on a new body of work for me that is uh, more about gender politics than anything else that I've done in the past. Leslie told me that she loves patterns and is just starting to become interested in using narrative in her work. As influences, she cites Gustav Klimt and the outsider artist Henry Darger. 
He made these books about these little girls and they were fighting a war and they were little girls with penises, which I thought was really weird and awesome. She created a colorful animation using flash and after effects. There's one part in the animation where it will scroll across these figures and there's a lot of color. And that is based on a repeat pattern panel piece that I've made. And then the little wooden figurines, I was sort of playing with these figures. And I looked at the figurines in the collection. They're all often for children, they're toys. And I thought they were very playful. And I imagine what the world would look like if people had little figurines that were sort of transgendered in between sex is rock and roll dudes. Christina saw Lincoln Seitzman's work in our permanent collection, but she really wanted to find the most complex piece that he had made. So she went into the artist file in our research library and found this piece and inspired her to find this piece of wallpaper which he end up slicing up into different layers. This is four different layers of the single sheet of wallpaper, but separated by a sheet of plexiglass. So the three-dimensional view of this wallpaper, which is actually what Lincoln wanted to do in his basket illusion pieces, through a single surface, make it look like it's three-dimensional. My name is Christina Day. This is a repeat pattern of a vintage wallpaper. I go for materials that are dated but brand new. Literally what this is is one repeat pattern that's been separated by the four color separations. The way this is lined up, all the areas that are open windows were white. I cut the white away from everything and then I separated it into the four layers that make the pattern to superimpose something. is actually a photographer's term, but I use it in textile work. It's overlaid over itself. Christina, how long did this take? That's a good question. I try not to count the hours because I love it so much. <laughs> you started it when you were six years old and you're now 24? <laughs> uh, no, but thank you. <laughs> hey, hi, I'm Alexis Nutini. Um, I'm a member of Napoleon um, and I made this piece over here. Alex also saw the work of Lincoln Seitzman. He was really intrigued by all the small pieces of wood that he put together to make the basket illusion went back to his shop and saw all this scrap wood laying on his floor. This is the way he felt that he could make a new piece of artwork, which is brand new for him. In fact, he never saw it fully uprighted until he brought it to the gallery. The way I generally work is printmaking. So this quilt, print, blanket, whatever it is, is made out of the byproducts of my printing process. Misprints, proofs, essentially paper ephemera. So cut off pieces of wood, newsprint, and messed up prints. The way I decided to interact with this collection, I decided I would start digitally interacting with a gallery on the webpage in order to find more inspiration. And that's when I ended up getting the idea of making it into a pixel print. Combining pixels and craft and weaving something and falling in between fine art as well as the craft tradition. When the tiles are held together, it's actually the only thing I spent money on. They're multicolored zip ties. I think the best part of it is that it's upcycled parts of my process that normally would have been thrown away to turn into a big object. My name is Marianne Dages. I'm a letterpress printer, a book artist. I made a piece that was inspired by Wanju Park's Smoothing Turning 3. I was really interested by the artist's idea of being inspired by the negligibility of a piece of paper and what paper means to people, how paper can be a carrier of information, and it's something physical but also something very ephemeral. I used all those ideas to make an installation. There are photos in the piece, and there's text in the piece as well, and both of those were garnered from the internet. Sites about the occult, new age practices. I'm really interested in what people look for when they're looking for help and what it means to them. The sculptural part of the piece represents aging and how we are all, like the piece of paper, going through this world very quickly. Hi, I'm Tim Simojanowski. 
this body of work was in response to a series of woodblock prints from the museum's collection and they were referring to landscape but they're really 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 abstract and I started thinking about what a modern day landscape might look like but abstracted through um, drawing and then printing those drawings in sanotype. So I drew a bunch of landscapes using different perspectives, looking over top of the landscape, looking from the side as if your feet were on the ground in the landscape, but all on the same piece of paper. Drawing made into a digital negative, and then the digital negative is printed onto paper that's been sensitized with cyanotype, which is a UV light sensitive material from the history of photography from 1842. It's one of the first photography methods of printing. So you're a photographer? I'm a photographer, yeah. yeah. I didn't meet Todd Baldwin at the opening, but I loved his chairs, which were inspired by a chair in the Center's collection made by Jay Brubaker. Hello, I'm Jaime Alvarez. And I'm an artist that's living in Philadelphia, born from Puerto Rico. The piece that I have made was bouncing off one of the pieces in the Center for Art and Wood collection, uh, which was a bracelet made out of pencil shavings. After going through the selections and hearing the stories that Albert had to tell about the different artists going through the residency program at the Center for Art and Wood, I was really attached to the pieces that were put together sort of haphazardly. Uh, Albert had told me that sketching was really important for the residency process, and I loved the idea, so I made a nine and a half by 11 rectangular piece made out of pencils titled Pencil Drawing for CAW or Center for Art and Wood. How many packets of pencils did you have to buy? You know, I made the piece twice. Uh, the first time around, I was showing off the logo, so I bought two boxes of 75 pencils, and I think I had to buy a third one. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. Oh, and I took off all the erasers, too, so I have them all at home. I'll probably use them for another piece, but yeah. Uh, I'm John Thompson, and uh, I made these uh, engine hoists with the blocks. We were invited to this show to bring a new audience in and respond to the collection. The first thing that I responded to was the Gary Knox Bennett pre-turned wood object. At first I thought it was a demonstration piece and then I realized it was actually a commentary on some of the objects in the collection. I also arrived at a couple other pieces, the David Pye bowl. He developed his own mechanism to carve these bowls and you see the grooves in them. And then I also found this Bob Stocksdale bowl really interesting. He's known for exotic woods and in this case he used Douglas fir, which is the same wood that you get as 2 by 4s at Home Depot. From those three and the communication that happened as I was researching the collection, and how many of these artists knew each other and collaborated in ways. I got this idea of the Chevy engine block, the big block and the small block. The mechanism for making these, I fed off of David Pye's idea. Uh, my grandfather was a pattern maker and had used this weird technique of hanging a pendulum from the ceiling to swing it to create a large bowl form. And so I did something similar. I hung a router from a ceiling to make the bowl forms in the pieces. And the materials are just from Home Depot, responding to this more common material that Bob Stocksdale used. Hi, I'm Terry Solon Frock. Well, Terry was really inspired by, I think, a really unique body of work. Frank Cummings, Jay Brubaker, and Walter Vallier. And she translated those ideas into ceramic and wood. Most of those pieces are rooted in imaginary architecture. I was reading Italo Calvino's Invisible Cities and also thinking about people in my life that were extremely special to me. I bought my house from an elderly woman who came from Italy. Her name was Quintina Bianca Melaragna, and her and her brother Mario lived in the home next door to me. And I bought the house from them. The bocce ball pieces that are part of this little tableau were theirs and were in the garage for probably like 90 years. When I bought my house, it was in 
pretty great disrepair. Lots of things were buttressed up with pieces of wood, and they had this crazy habit where they would bind parts of things that were falling down with Quintina's old pantyhose, and Mario would spread concrete out on them and fix things that were falling down. But he was a concrete worker too, so he built all these incredible turned concrete pots in the fountain in our yard. So these became homage pieces to them in dealing with architecture because I was responding to these pieces in the Wood Center's collection. The one that's by Frank Cummings is very architectural. And then I was really fascinated by the saffron containers by Jake Brubaker because there was such an amazing specialness about being given this hand-turned object, particularly special because it held the most expensive spice. It was given to you on your wedding day. So I started to think about these pieces that I made as almost imaginary homes for my departed most special people, like my dad, and my neighbors, and instructors that I was very close with, so. If you have a heart and or a mind and you love human ingenuity and imagination, you owe it to yourself to come and see this show.